Today we begin a new series of messages called Beginnings. It's based on the book of Genesis. This should take us up through uh, Christmas. Whether you're a teenager or a senior citizen, single or married, it's important that you understand how the world began. The Bible that most of us own, you may be surprised to learn, does not begin with Genesis. It begins with Jesus. It begins with the empty tomb. Hundreds of people announced that they had seen Jesus after he was crucified on the cross, that he was risen from the dead. The same people that ran the night Jesus was arrested showed up in Jerusalem and proclaimed, he's alive. If Jesus had been crucified and had not been raised from the dead, there would be nothing to write about. Uh, Without the resurrection, chances are you never would have known about the book of Genesis. When Jesus rose, a number of people began to document the life of Jesus. If he had not been raised, there would be nothing to document. We have at least four uh, that survived, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A fifth one, Paul. Paul began, his name was Saul, and almost overnight about 10,000 people became followers of Christ when they learned that he'd been raised from the dead. Well, Saul was a Jewish Pharisee, and this made him so angry that so many of his fellow Jews were becoming followers of Christ that he did everything he could to stamp out the Christian way. He was throwing Christians in prison. And one day he was traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus to throw Christians there in, in, in jail, and Jesus stopped him, spoke to him from the sky, and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, that's when Saul became a follower of Christ. And God called him to take the message of the resurrection to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Struggle for Gentiles coming to faith in Christ was giving up everything they had been taught to believe. They had to embrace the belief that there was one God. Up until that time, the Romans, Greeks, Persians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and Egyptians all taught that there were many gods. Nobody cared what gods you worshipped in your house, but they all agreed there were many gods. But Christians said there is only one God. You must give up all your gods. This made it difficult for Gentiles to come to faith. When Gentiles did come to faith... They became interested in the Jewish scriptures, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, The New Testament writers wrote in Greek. Uh, When they had finished writing and the canon of the Bible was formed, uh, 27 books were selected to be in the Greek Bible, and they called it the New Testament. And then they took the Old Testament scriptures, 66 books, and they called that the Old Testament. Um, once the Greek uh, New Testament was written and it was combined with the Old Testament, interest in the Jewish scriptures, uh, when Gentiles came to faith, they became very fascinated with the Jewish scriptures. This had never happened before. Over the centuries, very few Gentiles converted to Judaism. But now they were enamored with the Jewish text. Uh, They weren't looking to convert to Jewish faith. They were looking for Christ in the Old Testament. They were looking for prophecies about Christ, references to Christ, the backstory to Christ. The reason we know the Old Testament is because it was included in the canon of the Bible uh, of the Christian faith, which spread all around the world. Gentiles discovered that in the Jewish faith, which was older than Roman, Greek, Persian and Babylonian faith, Jews had always believed in one God. The implications were staggering. It meant that every other culture had it wrong. But the Jews knew it from the beginning. 
So they poured over the Jewish scriptures. They opened up to Genesis. So turn in your Bible to Genesis. Uh, there should be nobody fumbling around today. It's the first book in the Bible. It means origins, uh, beginnings, where it all began. The first line says, in the beginning, God. This was a shock. This was totally different from what Gentiles found in other religions. In other religions, they found, in the beginning, the gods. In other religions, multiple gods performed different functions, and they were warring with each other. In the 19th and 20th century, archaeological finds found creation narratives that cast doubt on the Bible. They found Egyptian, Assyrian, and Babylonian creation narratives that were very similar to the biblical account. And they concluded that the Hebrew Bible borrowed from these other cultures. It wasn't unique. It wasn't from God. So why take it seriously? Teenagers, maybe you've been taught something like this in, in high school or university students. You learn something about this in, in college. Why take the Bible seriously? Here's what's fascinating. This view has been pretty much abandoned in recent scholarship. Not only does the Hebrew account not borrow from other narratives, it stands in stark contrast with the other creation accounts. It says, in the beginning, God. There's only one God. There are not many gods like other religions. A myth suggests the Jewish text was way ahead of its time. The scientific community would not even begin to catch up with the first line in Genesis until 1927 when a Belgian priest suggested the theory we call the Big Bang Theory. The universe had a beginning. They found that in a flash of an eye, the universe expanded at an astronomical rate from nothing to the massive size it is today. From the time of Aristotle in the 4th century B.C., scientists assumed that the universe had always existed. Einstein thought the universe had always existed. But in 1964 with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the view that the universe has always existed was abandoned. Or, in the words of Moses, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Moses said the world had a beginning. The world began with God. Not many gods, one God. Now, we get all sidetracked with, you know, how long did it take? We read Genesis 1, and, you know, how did God do it? Uh, that's not Moses' point. Moses' point is that God did it. And only God did it. There aren't many gods. There aren't warring gods. There's one God. Genesis gives us a worldview that answers many of the Big questions we have in life. There are three worldviews competing for uh, the future of the world. Secularism slash atheism, Islam, and Christianity. Out of the 7.5 billion people in the world, uh, Christianity claims 2.4 billion adherents. Islam, 1.8 billion. Secularism, 1.2 billion. Hinduism, 1.1 billion. Buddhism, 500 million, and Chinese folk religions like Taoism, 500 million. Now, since all Buddhists, pretty much, are atheists, and many Taoists are atheists, we'll take 500,000 and 300,000, add that. So I think here's the real breakdown of worldviews. Christianity, 2.4 billion, Islam, 1.8 billion, and atheism, 2.0 billion clearly the three leading ideologies today. Secularists do not believe in God, but that evolution explains where we came from. 
Since there is no God, there are no moral absolutes. Uh, Each person must decide for himself what is right and wrong. Maybe this is the group that best represents you. You don't believe in God. You're not sure about Jesus Christ. You're not sure about where the world came from. Muslims believe that Allah created the world. Militant Wahhabism is the wing of Islam that is growing most rapidly, and they're prepared to use violence to impose their worldview on others. Christians believe that God created the world, but it's not just any God. Christians insist it is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in 2 Corinthians, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Colossians, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle John writes, this was our memory verse this week, if you're using our journal. If you haven't gotten a journal, by the way, we've got new ones for this series, Beginnings. Uh, Grab one as you go out from one of the hosts. Read with me, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. The Word is John's uh, reference in his book, the Gospel of John, to Jesus. The Apostle Paul says much the same thing. This is what Micah read to us just a few minutes ago. Read this with me. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. Paul suggests in Romans that it should be apparent to every human being in this world that there's a God. Read this with me. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Parents, when you see something beautiful, like Mount Hood, maybe with Trillium Lake in front of it, or Haystack Rock and with waves lapping up against it, maybe a a sunset, uh, this is a good opportunity for you to, to say that you believe God created this. Ask your, your kids what, what they're learning in school and what they believe. Christians believe that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit created the universe. Muslims say, no, you're wrong. You believe in three gods. Christians say, no, we believe in one God with three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here's the order in which he created things. Let's read through this together. This is Genesis 1. Read with me. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, The first thing God created was light. Read with me the next. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. The next thing God created was the sky. Read with me the next verse. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. So then God created dry land and plants and trees. Read the next verse. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. So next God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Read the next verse. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. Then God created fish and birds. Read the next verse. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, 
each according to its kind, and it was so. Then God created animals. Then the pinnacle of God's creation is the creation of humankind. More verses are devoted in Genesis 1 and 2 to the creation of, of you and me than, than anything else. So read this with me. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. We are made in his image. We have value. Genesis tells us that God created us to rule over the earth. This is where environmentalism came from. God tells us to take good care of the earth. Since we're expected to rule over the earth, that implies that we have keen minds. We have the ability to master the universe. One of the books I read this summer was John Adams by David McAuliffe. He was our second president, strong Christian. Uh, He considered being a pastor. Instead, he decided to go into public service. Uh, The thing he was most impressed with in God's creation was the creation of the mind. He writes, But all the provisions that he has made for the gratification of our senses are much inferior to the provision, the wonderful provision that he has made for the gratification of our nobler powers of intelligence and reason. He has given us reason to find out the truth and the real design and the true end of our existence. Adams was most impressed with our intellects, that God had given us the ability to think, to master this universe. Uh, Genesis answers the big questions of life. Why is there something rather than nothing? Where did I come from? Who am I? Why is there so much evil in the world? What's my purpose? Why does life matter? All these questions we're going to consider during this series. One of the leading worldviews today, secularism, tells us that there is no God. Life is meaningless, and my existence doesn't matter. Our lives have no significance beyond the present. Our existence is a quirk. Someday we will cease to exist. We'll pass into oblivion, and none of this will have mattered. Another worldview, Islam, tells us Allah is a cold, harsh, uncaring God. Joy and love are hard to find. Forgiveness is almost impossible. The third worldview, Christianity, tells us the world began with God. You were not created by the universe. You were created by God. There's a rhyme and a reason to your existence. You are here because there's a creator actively at work in this universe. And this creator is not just any God. He's the God and Father of of our Lord Jesus Christ, a God who loves you so much, He sent His Son to die for your sins. You can invite the Creator of the universe into your life today. Would you pray with me? Father, thank You for the first book in the Bible, Genesis. And we see today that it didn't begin with Genesis, but it began with Jesus, who was there before anything was written. And because he was raised from the dead, we have something to write about. And Lord, we thank you that we can believe that the world began with you and there's a purpose for our living. I want to give you a moment just to talk to God. I always believe it's important when we read the Bible to always apply it. And I want to give you a moment just to tell God something. If if you believe God created the world, tell him you believe that. And tell him you thank him that you can have confidence that he was in the beginning. If you've never given your life to Christ and you are ready today, you can thank him for dying for your sins, creating this world and then coming into the world uh, to tell us about God. And you invite him into your life right now. You pray. Father, thank you for telling us today that in the beginning, God, you existed before any of this any of us, and you're the reason for our existence, and you're the reason we're put on this earth to come to know you and serve you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.